Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for March the 11th, 2022. This is episode 101. On today's show, we'll be talking about the Volkswagen ID Buzz official reveal, the tease of the Chevy Blazer SS, and the Volvo XC40 Recharge gets a facelift. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs forum moderator and Inside EVs editor. Joining us today is the stupendous Tom Malogny, Inside EV's editor and host of the YouTube channel, State of Charge. We also have the mirthful Mr. Martin Lee from the <laughs> recently revamped EV News Daily podcast, which is available on all the best podcast platforms. And of course, Kyle Connor joins us from the majestic, practically palatial halls of the Out of Spec Studios, from where they produce videos for a growing number of YouTube channels. Okay, so before we get going, I'd like to ask that you please subscribe to the channel. If you're watching us on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button and ring that bell icon for notifications. If you're watching us on Twitch, and please do that, <laughs> you can also ring that bell icon for notifications. All right, so with that out of the way, welcome everybody. I, I laugh when I mentioned Twitch because we were just talking about that. And to be honest, like not a whole lot of people watch us on Twitch. I don't know if people watch podcasts generally on Twitch, but we're trying to build that audience. So. But in order to build the audience, you have to have followers to watch. It. They have it's a weird platform. So, but if you have it, you know, feel free to watch this watch along. All right, so <laughs> let's uh, kick it off with our comment of the week, or Katwa for short. Uh, so last week, Steve B commented, "Tesla tequila on Tom's shelf." Shots. Excellent suggestion, Steve. Thanks for that. So for a little context, uh, last week we celebrated our 100th regular episode of the Inside EVs podcast. Some of us were drinking champagne first thing in the morning. And by some of us, I mean me. <laughs> uh, Kyle was fresh out of booze. Martin had some green matcha health drink of some kind. and uh, Awful. <laughs> Tom, Tom had coffee. However, behind Tom was a bottle of Tesla Kila which is an agave a tequila anejo that's uh, been aged in French oak barrels and features a dry fruit and light vanilla nose with a balanced cinnamon pepper finish, uh, I'm told. <laughs> I'm not sure if Tom has special plans for his bottle, but I, I've seen it available online for about $1,300. Uh, but if we're ever all in the same place at the same time, well, let's just say I'll bring the salt and the lemons. All right, I'll crack it open for that. If we're ever uh, still right there behind me, if we're ever uh, all together, we'll have to do uh, Tesla tequila shots. That'd be awesome. But for now, it's just a prop in the back behind me. Right. I mean, you could always fill it back up with, like, I don't know, maple syrup. It would probably still look the same. How do you know I haven't already done that? <laughs> yeah, it's true. <laughs> all right. So let's talk about what, what we've been driving this week. Um, so... Kyle, you had put up an interesting video this week uh, with the Mercedes EQS 450 Plus doing a 0 to 100 charging curve test. Um, I don't know if you want to tell us about that. I guess it was hard to find the right um, charger to actually do this test properly because not all chargers are the same, even from the same company with the same, you know, 350 kilowatt or whatever you know, power output label that's on there, they're still not all the same. So maybe start with that part. Yeah. So I think it's important to note that the EQS is the first car that I've tested other than Tycon at low state of charge, pretty much that, well, I guess Tycon does too. It's one of the first cars I've tested that pulls more than 350 amps. And that is because this car is rated for a 200 kilowatt peak charging rate from the manufacturer. And over the last few months, I have driven every version of EQS. I've tried to charge it at least four or five times, and I never have been able to get more than 150, 160 kilowatts. And I'm like, what is going on here? How could they rate this at 200 kilowatts? And then I started looking into it and thinking about it, and I'm like, wait a second. Obviously, this is a 400-volt car. And for it to get 200 kilowatts at 400 volts, you need 500 amps. And so... You know, even though the charger might say 350 on the front of it, 350 kilowatts, that would be, in theory, they could label it at 350 amps at a thousand volts. And this car is obviously at much lower voltage. So um, then started my journey of exploration into which charging stations can actually deliver 
uh, of true 500 amp maximum. And that is the basically spec of the CCS charging handles maximum power output. And um, in Europe, for example, Tesla uses CCS. And CCS, of course, does have a 500 amp maximum, but not for Tesla. They push it farther. And so they don't oh. follow the recommended, I believe, Charin standard of a 500 amp maximum. And so uh, I just brought that up because I knew everyone was going to say, well, Tesla does it. Yes. And it's great. So basically, I went to the 350 kilowatt station by my house here in uh, the station in Loveland, Colorado, and plugged it in. And I was like 140, 142 kilowatts. And it's just ramping up a little bit. I'm like, well, we have a 350 amp limitation. And it was on an ABB unit. And since then, uh, Electrify America has confirmed, yeah, you, you, you're absolutely right. That charger's derated. And, um, you know, we're just waiting on a power module or something that they don't know when it'll come in to fix that issue. But the station's technically capable of 500 amps. It's just software limited. But so anyway, I found the only working 500 amp charger in uh, my area. There's actually a few of them down in Denver that just went online from EVgo. And uh -huh. it's in partnership with this uh, Ultium battery pack uh, uh, expansion for charging networks for the GM funded stuff. And I have to say it was a wonderful charger. It was a signet unit. They give you all the nerdy data you could want. They give you volts, amps, kilowatts, times there, kilowatt hours delivered, the cost. They even explain what each of these things mean. It really uh, was a one of the best user experiences from a software perspective. You know, you don't have to hit the screen every 60 seconds. At the end of your charging session, they even print you out your own charging curve. It's really nice, really well done. So I am now have turned into an EVgo fanboy after this experience. It was really wonderful. Um, and, you know, th it was just a kind of a hard thing to find, you know. So basically the cars that are going to be affected by this 500 amp situation are going to be i4, iX, EQS, Rivian, R1T, R1S. And then, of course, anything, uh, you know, like Hummer EV, Silverado EV, since those aren't 1,000 volt cars, they're 800 volt uh, they're still going to need more than 350 amps to reach uh, 350 kilowatts. Maybe not the full 500, but they're going to need quite a bit. And so this is a whole wild west of EV charging right now. Technically, a 350 kilowatt charger could be rated at 350 amps because of the 1,000 volts, theoretically, assuming the charger can, can output that much uh, current at that high voltage, it can be rated for that. And a 500 amp at whatever it is, 700-ish volts could technically be also a 350 kilowatt charger. So welcome to the Wild West. That's, that's kind of crazy. It's all over the place. But uh, so what does this mean for like the regular user? Like in terms of if they pull up to a charger that's, you know, in a, say in a Tycon uh, that has... You know, it's 350, but it's getting so it's getting 500 amps like this EVgo charger, or one that gets you know 350 amps to like uh, if they're there for a half an hour. What, what kind of like roughly what difference would that make in, in terms of like miles charged? Yeah, well, a Tycon not much because that's 800 volts. So 350 right. amps at you know 720 volt dead on a Tycon, okay. it, or maybe even high sixes would be pretty good. Um, you know, it'll probably be around 200. 40 kilowatts at that point and i've seen this many times with tycon i'm like you know i had this tycon in in europe for a few weeks uh last year and i was like why am i just plugging it and rocking at 270 many times i'm finding this thing starting at 240 and it's walking its way up to 270 and it's this amperage limitation that they have so tycon's not really affected by it ionic 5 and ev6 are not affected by it because they're pretty much using all of the the 350 amps um, and it's really the cars that are affected by it are going to be these, this EQS, the Rivian. I think a lot of people are going to have issues with now keep in mind, like, um, 50 kilowatts doesn't sound like much of a difference because that's going to be your difference between a, a 350 amp or a 500 amp on a 400 volt system. It's going to be, you know, about 140 kilowatts to 200 peak, but it's time and it's, a big difference in my opinion it would be annoying basically to be sitting there with a rivian with 135 kilowatt hour pack and mm. only charging at 140 kilowatts when i know the thing can do 200 right i mean uh, it's it, it's worse over here because we have a national network that was 10 years old got bought last year 
by GridServe. They're the ones with the, the electric forecourt idea, and their charges are great. But because they have to update all of the hardware in the network they bought, the old uh, electric highway, kept, kept the name but replaced the, uh, the hardware, a lot of those grid connections were done in an EV world of 10 years ago. So I went to go use my first one that's labeled 125 kilowatt chargers, I think. They're the ABB Terra somethings. Um, great units, really great ABB hardware. And plug the car in, it's getting like 56, 58, 60 kilowatts. And I'm thinking, this is this is crazy slow. There's something wrong with the charger. And just by chance, happened to go and look at the little sticker on the side. It's the, I think it's at the top on the ABB units of, of what that's rated for. And it was a 150 amp charger. And that'll be because the, the grid connection they've got is, is that's the limiting factor. And so with the best will in the world, like the MG runs a pretty high voltage, actually about 450 volts. Um, maybe it was at 420 volts on an I plugged in, but you know, that's, that's it. That's your max. If you're on a 150 amp unit or a 200 amp unit, if you're lucky on a lot of those older connections, it's a whole nother confusing thing because you turn up, it says 125 kilowatt fast charger. You know, it's, it's going only at half the speed. This is crazy. Well, you, you know, unless you've got an 800 volt car, you're not going to get anywhere near that. And that's the thing. And, and in, in Germany, when we were using the ENDV chargers, they actually label the charger output for a 400 volt car or an 800 volt class of car. And I thought that was pretty genius in my opinion. I'm like, oh, this makes sense. People get it. This, these are the, the classes. And so what I think what's, what we're coming to an agreement with is there's no standard on how to label chargers and we right. should create one. So <laughs> we're gonna, I'm going to work on this with some videos over time and uh, you know, I, you know, at least share my opinions. I want everyone to share sure. theirs as well. But I think um, you know, just, just to fit, wrap up on this EQS situation, the charging curve was great, really is a fat charging curve. You can watch that on uh, out of spec reviews if if you're really boring, uh, you know, or want to be bored, I should say. The, um, the no, 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 no our, our audience isn't boring, man. <laughs> no, I'm not saying. I'm saying if you really want to fall asleep, watch this video. And so, <laughs> the the thing with EQS to me, I guess, really my main coming to the end of my week driving it, I put a lot of miles on it, spent a lot of time with it. Um, it could have been so much better <laughs> from an engineering perspective because Mercedes has always been the technological leader in automotive for the last 50, 60, 70 plus years um, with S-Class. It's always been the peak. And then you have EQS that comes out and it's 400 volt. And really the only benefit they would have had to go with an 800 volt system would have been more efficient charging, of course, just in transmission, but also, um, you know, this 350 amp limitation wouldn't have been a big deal for it. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure it would be worth it for them to spend all the X number of money and componentry and everything to make it an 800 volt system, but it's an S class. It should just do it regardless of the price. And so I think that's, to me, it's like, it's a good car, great car really is. Uh, but, but like not the peak in terms of technological advancement. And that's where it honestly should be. So I, do you think, uh, like, I think, um, uh, the whole industry will go to 800 volts at least at some point. What it just makes more sense. Maybe uh, it's already it's already moving that way. Yeah, I I guess why with, not, right? It, it's, it's not right now. It's more expensive to make an eight hundred volt system architecture because a lot of the third party suppliers that supply the supporting right. hardware are not producing enough a thousand volt capable items, and then they're also more expensive to go for those, like significantly more. But of course, this right. this will adapt and change. But I think all these cheap EVs, you know, city cars and stuff, there's no reason for them to go any higher voltage than. 350 volts like my smart car i don't even think is a 300 volt system car like it's a really low voltage car and it just doesn't need to have a high voltage because it just drives around the city and level two charges and i think we'll see more low power smaller you know sort of inexpensive city cars where we don't need to spend the money on on high voltage yeah i, I agree with kyle i don't dom i don't think necessarily everybody is going to be at you know 800 or or higher 900 volt systems moving forward and maybe way down the road we might get to that but one of the really important things that that kyle mentioned and there's no excuse for mercedes because it's a high-end top of the line luxury vehicle but a lot of the reason why some of the oems hadn't gone there already was the cost of the components porsche and and lucid for instance 
they had to design and make all of their own components because there was nothing off the shelf that was available, you know, and that's expensive doing that. So, you know, we're talking about trying to get the cost down of electric vehicles. They're already more expensive than comparable gas cars. And now you're saying, okay, now you've got to in-house design all these extra components and it's going to add costs. So um, we might get there, but, um, you know, for the immediate future, I don't think it's going to be a fait accompli that every new right. EV coming out is going to have an 800 or, or higher volt system. One other thing I'm interested in hearing from Kyle was Kyle, we talked about the, the how long it would take to charge that it's kind of an annoyance if the if the charging station can't deliver the full power that some of these new evs coming out would be able to rivian bmw's vehicles the the eqs did you do i know you've done the full charging session on this um ev go station that could deliver the full power did you also do a full charging curve on an electrify america charging station that was derating the power you yes, did. but I can't find the footage. <laughs> so <laughs> I did this months ago with an EQS. Actually, when we held that EV Media Summit thing, mm -hmm. um, I did it with the EQS there, plugged in at zero, and I genuinely don't know where the footage went. Uh, oh. And I wanted to, I've been looking for it, trying to dig it up because I wanted to compare the difference. That's what I was getting at. And the thing is, it holds more than 150 kilowatts all the way past 50%, almost to 60%. So from zero to 60%, you are limited. Mm -hmm. And then everything after that is the same, of it's, course. Yeah. Um, so I'll be getting an EQS soon in, in a couple of weeks. So if you can't find it, um, I will do that here. And then we'll, 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 put, them, we'll put them together, your, yours and mine together on a, on a graph and see what the comparison is. But I'm not as worried as you were because personally, I mean, yes, it's, 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 a, it's a premium vehicle. You want to charge as quickly as possible. Um, but I think most people aren't going to notice that big of a difference time wise. I could be wrong when we put these things together. And I know you said it's a fat curve. So that's leaning towards maybe you being more right than I am. But it'll be interesting to see. I think the 10 to 80 percent, which is what most people really going to aim at the zero to 100. We can throw that out. We do that just to, to, to print out a full charging curve. But the 10 to 80 percent, which I think most people focus on, I don't think it'll be more than five to seven minutes longer. Um, uh, uh, even if you pull up to a charging station that can't deliver the full power. Now, for you and me, that's an eternity because we talk minutes and we keep charging these. We compare them to different vehicles. But I think for a lot of uh, EQS owners on a road trip, they wouldn't even notice the difference. And let me tell you, I, I, I think I told you guys this offline. I may have said it in last week's podcast. I don't think so. But this week I was doing charger recordings and I pulled up uh, to an Electrify America charging station. There was a guy in a Tycon and I noticed he was charging. He was at a low state of charge, like 28% state of charge or 30% state of charge. And the car was pulling 151 or 152 kilowatt. And I'm, I'm looking at it. I couldn't help myself. I had to go over and, 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 and he was at 150 kilowatt DC fast charger. So I had to go over and knock on his window and say, you know, I hit the my, my own business, but there's two 350 kilowatt stations open over there. You should really plug in over there and look at me because that eh, doesn't make a difference. And I was like, mm, it kind of does. And he's like, listen, I've I've charged at those tons of times, even in this, because we got to the, the temperature thing, even in August, he goes, this car has never pulled more than 155 to 150 kilowatts. I said, well, there's something wrong with your car then <laughs> because he's like, I, and he named the places he's been to the 350 kilowatt stations. I was like, Take that to Porsche because the, you you know I've charged a lot of Taycans and his attitude is just kind of like eh this is fast enough it really what, what's it gonna what's it gonna save me five minutes of time he's like right. you know I've seen some of the videos out there and everything he goes he goes I, I'm here like twenty five to seventy five percent something like that he goes he goes eh, it's not even worth it so it, it depends on who you you and me analyze and crunch these numbers like religion you know but I, I think the average person isn't gonna really it won't make that much of a difference if it's five to seven minutes. Now, if it's 10 to 12 minutes, okay, we'll talk about it. But let's see when we put those things right up against each other and see the 10 to 80% difference. Yeah, I think that'll be interesting. And I totally agree. I think most people just want it to plug in and to work. And I think yeah. most people would be happy at 100 kilowatts. Uh, you know, but, but the thing is, from my perspective, none of this will get better unless we push it. <laughs> And right, we make more people aware. Some people may not know. A lot of people might think, hey, this thing says it should do 200 kilowatts, regardless if it saves them time. 
And then they're going to think it's the car and they're going to try and warm it up. Like I would been doing for the last you know few months until I was like, oh crap, even though this charger says it's rated for 500 amps, it might be physically or software derated. And that was the case. And the thing is most 350 kilowatt stations across the country, at least in my experience, are derated to uh, 350 amps. I think it's only the new signets with the newest software update. And we heard through the grapevine, maybe some Canadian BTC stuff, but pretty much everything else on Electrify America. And I hope they correct us if we're wrong here. I, I don't want to say this as fact because I haven't tested every station, but I think there's a, a large percentage of them that have this 350 amp limit. Uh, I know a lot of the new EV Go installs, they're using, I think, Delta or Signet units, and those can all do 500 amps, um, at least from what I know. So anyway, that's the situation. I just think we need to, to just educate people about this stuff, whether or not it actually makes a difference in the real world. I totally agree with you, Tom. I think it's a few extra minutes and it's not, is, not a big deal. Is it the hard, Do you think it's the hardware cost or is it the grid connection? And not considering the grid the connection. Considering we're doing a, a mini series on infrastructure, uh, I haven't we haven't asked this question yet. Um, and also, one of my podcast sponsors um, is a company that that sells hardware, so I could always ask you know those guys they're experts. But do you think that do you think the limiting factor is what they can hook up to at the site, and then the juice they can get? Because you start to get to five hundred amps, and you want to put in a bank of six, eight, or ten chargers, and you you get into some juicy grid connections there, aren't you? I guess. Yeah, but they already have the grid connections. That's not the issue at all. It's just that the chargers don't have the push because keep in mind, they have four, you know, 350 kilowatt chargers or four 150. One, if I'm the only car there, it should just dump everything in there. So in that case, it's the, what? It's it's the hard, it's it the, the, it's the, the availability hardware. of the hardware, the cost of the chargers. What is it? Both. Both. Oh, okay. And so what EA told me, and again, I'm not, I don't want to say this came from anyone technical on their team, but they said, hey, we're just uh, waiting for another power module to be installed. And so essentially that would just bump up to 500 amps from 350 because they'd probably come in packs. And so whether or not they're derating it to prolong the charger's life, it hasn't been an issue. This has not been an issue until EQS and until Rivian. No cars could max these things out until right about now. And I have a Rivian coming on like a few days from now. I'm taking oh, yeah. on a big road trip. And uh, actually, yeah. We'll talk about that. <laughs> we'll talk about the next time. <laughs> I don't want to share Maybe too in a much. couple of weeks. I don't know. <laughs> but this, I think, is going to be a limiting factor on this road trip. And and Tony S just said the grid connection is the limiting factor. Tony, it's not. Trust me, <laughs> it's not the it's it's the hardware. And the the fact of the matter is, um, this as Kyle just said, and that he just made the point of this whole discussion. It hasn't been an issue until right now. And Electrify America, this is all my opinion didn't focus on this because it wasn't an issue. You know, they're, they're, right. they're, they're focusing on the issues. Now, all of a sudden, the, these cars are coming to market that can stress their units, actually um, can take in more power than the units can deliver. And now they're like, okay, um, we, need to, we need to make sure these can deliver the full amount of power. I fully believe that they understood this from the beginning, that, the, that uh, obviously the engineers knew that the, the, the charging stations were gonna be limited with 400 volt systems. And they just kicked the can down the road. They just said, you know what? Uh, uh, we'll deal with this when it happens. Now it's happening. And now they're going to upgrade the, the stations to be able to deliver the extra amount of power. So I simply think it was a fact that, you know, when Electrify America came out a couple of years ago, as we've said many times, and we're very critical of Electrify America with reliability and things like that at some times. But at some times, we also have to say, hey, they were putting stuff in the ground that nobody else was. It yeah. was they had to design this stuff. They had to make the components. That's why they went with a multiple, uh, uh, a multiple of different uh, providers because no one manufacturer could make as no, uh, enough equipment. And I also think they wanted to see, okay, who who was going to be best for long term. It was almost like they gave out four contracts and they said, you know, we're gonna we're, we'll stick long term with the guys that actually deliver and make good equipment that's reliable. And they've already eliminated one of their original four manufacturers. They only have three now. So I fully believe that they said, OK, maybe that was a, a, a going to hold them back in the beginning or it was going to cost a lot more to have the higher powered hardware. And they said, we'll deal with these 400 amp, uh, you know, uh, the 400 volt battery packs when when they can pull more than 200 kilowatts when it comes. We're here now and now they're going to upgrade. We'll see. 
but I expect new equipment like Kyle just pulled up at with uh, EVGO, knowing that there are charging, there are cars that can accept that power. New equipment in the ground now should all be able to, to deliver the 200 kilowatts, even if you have a 400 volt system. Yeah. And EV goes basically being paid by GM to install a lot of this stuff in some sort of partnership. I don't know the extent of it, but basically GM is not going to pay to put in chargers that don't max out a Hummer EV or Silverado EV and things right. like that. So th those are going to do 500 amps for sure, yeah. or, or at least more than 350. Those have like 200 kilowatt hour batteries, so they need as much juice as fast as they can get it in there. Uh, so just to underline that point, Scott B. Uh, left the comment, as someone who manages an EV infrastructure program for major utility, it's not the grid connection. When we design the interconnection for any fast starting station, it's a support to the max kilowatt. It's to support the max kilowatt. Basically, yeah, it's not the grid connection. Now, there yeah. are scenarios where they will dynamically limit the total site output around demand charges, but you're probably not yeah. going to hit that with just one car. And so you you probably need a few cars there for them to, to pull it down. And also they can have battery pack storage on site, but that's for our Monday shows. So, right. Uh, and just a, a note. So last Monday, we didn't have a show. We had to post phone it. And uh, hopefully, we'll, I'm not sure if we have one next Monday. Tom, do we have anything next Monday? Working on it. It's not, um, don't have any clarification on yet, unfortunately. So at this point, it's Friday. I'm going to say we pr it's probably not going to be a go okay. for next week yet. So we'll resume the infrastructure series as soon as we, um, as we uh, have a guest that's available we, to show yeah. up. And we can all do it. We have a lot. We're going to be a lot of us are going to be pretty busy in the next couple of weeks. So uh, just like click that bell icon for notifications, <laughs> and then uh, you'll you'll know when we get when we have a guest on and be able to catch that. Um, I think we want to. We'll be speaking with ChargePoint probably next though. Um, all right. So real quickly, uh, so the EQS 450 plus. So what kind of uh, zero to hundred time did you get? Uh, I think it was one hour, 17 minutes. EVGO shuts off after one hour, which is really freaking annoying. So we had to reconnect <laughs> the whole situation. And I heard during peak times, they shut off after 30 or 45 minutes. EVGO, we need a special card that does not shut off after an hour. So please get that to us by like Wednesday. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that won't happen. So um, yeah, great, great charging curve. Sits at 200 kilowatts, still 40%. Ramps down as you would expect. Very solid, very repeatable. Doesn't really even overheat the car. Fans kicked on at like 50% state of charge. It was fine. And so, uh, yeah, gr great charging curve. So if you roll up with 10% and you want to charge to 80%, but how long do you think you're going to sit there? I don't know. I didn't do the math because 10 to 80 <laughs> in my mind doesn't make sense. Why would you charge to 80? This is a zero to 50% on a road trip. Um, uh, okay. I understand some people like this 10 to 80 thing. Right. I don't like it. I know that's going to become the industry standard, but right. I'm going to hold strong and go against it because okay. I think that's silly. For me, the reason I do a charging curve is because it's it's not for the general public. They just, they just plug in and don't worry about it. It's yeah. for the nerds who are into charging curves. And if you're like me, you're plugging in zero on road trips anyway, and you want to rocket this charging curve until it starts to taper and go. And so this is a zero to 50% unplug and hammer to the next station kind of car. All right. Uh, okay. So Tom, um, I understand Ford Pro launched uh, a comprehensive suite of commercial EV chargers this week, and you wrote that up for the um, for the Inside EVs website. So uh, maybe you can tell us just a little bit, a little bit about that. Sure. And the point really wasn't to talk about the specific hardware that they launched. Right. Um, what 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 the point the, that I thought was very important was. Um, the fact that Ford is investing a lot of energy into uh, being like just an end to end provider of charging for their fleet customers. That's really important. Um, I have had a lot of conversations with companies here in New Jersey that want to electrify their fleet, uh, businesses that have fleets of vans, that have trucks, even a, a, a bus company here in, in New Jersey that's a very large bus company. And one of the biggest issues is they're like, okay, yeah, we, we get this electrification. We're all in. We'll, we'll buy electric buses. We'll buy electric vans. But we don't know anything about charging them. Like the, the refueling the, the diesel and gas vehicles is so easy. They have a pump behind the, the, their facility, and they, they fill up their own fuel. Uh, and if it's a small company, they just go to gas stations. They have a corporate credit card, and that's it. It's not an issue. But when you buy these electric vehicles, you're – 
you're just beginning to have to deal with how you're going to manage your fleet. It's it, 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 you're adding problems that the companies didn't have before. So what Ford's doing is they they're having this holistic approach where they have a range of different equipment from you know uh, 11 kilowatt AC level two chargers all the way up to 180 kilowatt DC fast chargers. And they'll have somebody come out and do a, a site analysis of your facility. They'll uh, recommend what uh, equipment you can have. They can help you install it. And then once it's installed, they have the back end software so that fleet managers can manage their, their, their charging and um, save money with time of use, um, battery buffering, oh, 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 a range of, of, of things they can offer. And um, this is unique because the company's doing it. And typically in the past, third party companies do this like Ampli Power. They'll come in and analyze your facility and do it for you. But what I liked about this was, you know, the, the, the company has a relationship with Ford. You know, they buy Ford vehicles, 20, 30, 40, 100 uh, trucks. Um, and so they trust Ford. They trust them for service and everything. And, and this is just an extension. Ford saying, look, we'll take care of all of that for you. We'll even help you with the software to manage your fleet once it's done. This is one-stop shopping. You don't have to, you know, talk to this new, a new company that you've never dealt with before that's based in California or wherever. Uh, it's here. It's, it's, you know, your local Ford guys are going to hold your hand and help you make this electric transition. And to me, that's what was so powerful about this. I didn't really get into the equipment itself. It was just that Ford is going to tell their customers, look, we got your back. You want to switch to electrification? We'll help you through every step of the way. And that's really important. Great points. Great points. Yeah. Because uh, the hardware itself wasn't, it was kind of interesting, you know, 11 kilowatt AC charger, uh, the Ford Pro Station that comes with the Lightning. And then there's a few different, you know, what, up to 150 kilowatts, do you say, chargers? Up, up to 180 kilowatts in 30 kilowatt increments. So there's all different levels of power um, that the units can deliver. And uh, like I said, uh, the big part about it is they're not just selling you stuff. They're, they're, they're going to help you. They're going to do site analysis. They're going to help right. you decide how much you need, where you need to install it help you with your grid inter interconnections. You know, I mean, sure they'll have electrical contractor that they've contracted to do this. And then they're gonna provide the software management, which is paramount that these fleet managers can actually understand their energy use and, and, and massage it because you'll be able to save a lot of money on when you charge and how you charge. And, and that's something that, like I said earlier, the, the, these companies wanna go to electrification, but they don't know anything about that. And, right. uh, and and this is giving them, like I said, a, a trusted partner that they've been dealing with for years, said, look, I'll hold your hand. I'll walk you through this. We'll 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 show you how how, you know, you don't have to contact anybody else. We'll take care of everything for you. Now, of course, customers could could say, you know, we don't need Ford to do this. We're going to hire a, an outside firm. But the fact that Ford is providing the service, I think it's and financing for it. Because that's, oh, that's, that's, a that's a huge question. Deal. That's a huge question when, when people are buying all these vans. Oh, these vans are great. You know, they're going to save us money. Electricity is 11 cents a kilowatt hour. Gas is, is 5 cents a gallon. But well, wait a minute. Um, I've got to install $700,000 worth of, <laughs> of charging equipment on my property. You know, so, right. uh, you know, uh, Ford's going to help them, help them get uh, available rebates, uh, all of that stuff. Because right now there's a ton of money out there for infrastructure. Um, in federal, state, even county, even utility based. So, um, you know, yeah, I think it's huge that Ford is doing this. And I think it was a bigger story than what it got in the news, I guess, because it was Ford sure. Pro, not Ford Proper. And, you know, this is a commercial side of the business. But um, I, I was really stoked about it. That's a huge market waiting to be conquered. And yeah, if they can get the, the message out to commercial, you know, businesses that they have this like over, overall solution, they could really corner that, I think. Sounds like, I don't know. Uh, does anyone else have a, no one else that really has a commercial side like this, do they? Uh, the major automakers, GM? Well, they have commercial divisions, but um, right. we haven't seen anything like but this about electrification yet. Yeah. yeah. But Ford's first to market with the, with the transit, you know, and uh, lightning right. coming out now. So, you know, um, you would expect them to be first on this, but let's see if the other guys follow. I mean, I think if they don't, it gives Ford a distinct advantage when you're trying to move your fleet uh, to electric. I guess if I was a competitor, I would look at 
being able to produce the only way to get in there really is to like being able to produce more vehicles and actually be have vehicles to sell. So, I mean, that's a huge, a huge part of the whole equation as well. Just having the, the trucks to sell to, you know, because there's, everybody's pretty limited still at this point. Uh, all right. So let's move on a little bit. Oh, so uh, yesterday, uh, Lucid CEO Peter Rollinson put out this video, video for Lucid. Uh, he's a yeah, CEO of Lucid. He's also the CTO, Chief Technical Officer, I believe. Is that right, Yes, Tom? Right. So he put out this video yesterday. Uh, man, it's great. If you're Even if you're not like an EV geek, I... I found it pretty inter pretty interesting just on the, uh, I don't know what level, just on an entertainment sort of level. I mean, it wasn't, you know, there's no like song and dance, but just, it's just walking us through, you know, electricity, batteries, how the Lucid battery pack is designed. And he even gave some proprietary uh, information about his own, their own designs and, and things. It was pretty, uh, pretty, well, pretty. One thing I thought was interesting was he got in a pretty good detail. This is like the perfect 101 course that I want to yeah. hand to someone that says, hey, before you watch one of our charging curves or before a range test or something, can you just watch this and understand this? But there was still more to learn in here, even uh, you know from, from guys like us, because Lucid shared a couple interesting uh, uh, tidbits. One that I thought was really interesting was the wire bonds from the battery pack to yes. the bus bar. They have one fused wire bond that's pretty small and, and highly resistive. And they have another one that's pretty beefy that can flow pretty nicely. And I was like, well, there's just a little inch of efficiency right there. And they can do that because they produce everything in-house and it just shows their engineering might in that uh, department. It was really impressive. Yeah, absolutely. Just if you haven't watched this, just just watch it. I mean, uh, honestly, it, it, you know, we don't have to go into detail and talk about everything that was right. said in, in the video, right. but it was a master class. And Rollinson, um, in my opinion, you know, as as respected as he was after this, I think people are going to really look at him as as, you know, he, he even has more credit because, you know, it's one thing to understand what's going on. It's another thing entirely to be able to explain it so people understand it. You know, I struggle with that sometimes. I, I right. think when I do instructional videos and EV charging videos, I think sometimes I watch it and I'm like, wow, I didn't explain that well. You know, I, I didn't say what was in my mind, you know, and, and I don't think people are going to understand what I, the point I was trying to make. But Rollinson, it just is natural, like like he's like a college professor, you know, and like, uh, but, the, but not the boring. way he explained everything was you know everybody and what kyle said kyle even learned something and you know if kyle learned some kyle knows a lot about batteries and charging um and the funny thing is in my i tweeted about this last night and i said look if if you don't learn something from this video you're either much smarter than the average person or you really weren't paying attention when you watched it because this is packed with really cool information from the most basic knowledge that you should kind of understand about evs Two, you know, little real technical tidbits that Kyle picked up on. So, you know, just go watch this thing is all I can tell you. And, and it, you know, the thing is, this is going to be a series. They're making 10 videos. Right. Rollinson's going to do four or five of them. There's going to be other people in, in, in the videos. I, 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 I almost think they set the bar too high because, like, you know, this was awesome. And uh, I'm interested to see how they follow it up. I almost can't imagine the rest of the videos in the series are going to be as well done as as uh, the because premiere. it wasn't aimed at the entry level viewer. It was aimed at someone who already has a general understanding of EVs. It fixes some mixed misconceptions and it put it in this really nice package. And the thing, you know, the motivation behind Peter for doing this and Lucid, I think, is something that we can all really appreciate because it makes our jobs easier. It focuses on if everyone can just get to this level of understanding, right, this basic knowledge, then our coverage can go deeper. And so what we really need to do is just force everyone to watch this 50 times. I've, I sent it to my dad because it was perfect yeah. for him because he is getting into electric cars now, but he's not sh quite sure of voltage versus amps versus how does this affect my charging curve? What actually gets hot? How are the cells cooled? What are right. the different strategies? And so he can watch this and now we can have much more meaningful conversations with our time. And uh, it's a really wonderful tool that I'm going to send to everyone. 
Yeah, he lays lays it all out there, like right from the foundation of it. Watts, what are Watts? What are you know? Vol everything is like all there. I'm gonna watch it again. I watched it last night. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch it again at least once because, uh, like you said, there's there's a bunch of stuff in there. There's one more lucid piece that I don't think we're planning on talking about, but since we're on the topic of lucid, sure. uh, yeah. did you all watch the Haggerty lucid review by any chance? I did. That because was you tweeted about it. The finest automotive review or impressions video, whatever you want to call it, that I've ever watched in history. It was better than Top Gear. It was awesome. They were drifting around Lucids. They had a Rivian towing a Lucid. The filming was amazing. And um, yeah, really sets the benchmark, I think, for what a automotive review should look like, in my opinion. Some of you guys may know we've been doing a lot of stuff at Out of Spec here, and this is what we have our eyes on, is stuff like this, maybe once a week or once every two weeks, a special and, um, you know, w it's going to take time to get there, but like, this was so epic on so many right. levels. I think in inside AVs will have a post on with that, uh, with that video on it later today. Um, I thought it was super entertaining. I'm not sure if it like, I, I prefer to watch it like auto get fool with the Thomas is like, I think it's maybe my favorite or Doug Murrow. Some people like Doug Murrow a lot. I know you do. Um, but well, just that's why the there's different reviewers. Right. right. There's but, not but, one reviewer that anyone watches. But uh, but for entertainment and the pr production values, man, this was pretty awesome. <laughs> and it's not like it's Top Gear. Like they had two camera people. That's what's crazy. To really? Me. That was two yeah, camera people? Two camera people. Man. One director, one guy who wrote it and presented it, and then two camera people. The and writing was, was pretty good. good. The writing was pretty good. I thought they could have used the uh, – uh, it's a little bit – guyish in some places but um yeah okay but, but it's a beautiful <laughs> review forget about what's inside of it just turn the audio off and just watch it yeah no it's great just cinematography in terms of filming is what i'm saying was yeah. wonderful right definitely yeah um all right uh anything else martin did you drive anything this week uh, you're on mute yeah <laughs> We we got the one second. He's one second. It was like five seconds. Uh, okay. I couldn't un I couldn't unmute myself. I had you off my screen. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what did I drive this week? I'm not sure. I've done too much this week at all. As you guys know, I handed back uh, my buddy's original Arnic, which I've fallen in love with with its twenty something kilowatt hour battery, just because of how how efficient it is and because it's just a load of car for the money. Uh, what I have been doing this week is getting my Renault Zoe ready to sell. Uh, second running story that we've had battery lease it's two and a half years old now fifteen thousand miles and as you guys know we bought the mg we need more family uh room and so no point having a car on the driveway which we just don't drive anymore so i've been getting that ready uh so getting all the little dinks and dents out uh with my buddy uh richard uh who uh you guys met when he came over kyle to your your media summits uh richard has a an, an ev dealer simon's Yes, Richard Simons. So uh, he sells a ton of used EVs, and he's his place is like ten minutes from mine. So right. um, he's got a guy. Obviously, he's got he's got a guy and a girl for everything. But he's got a one of these magicians that takes out the 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 car park door dents, which looks so unsightly. But I swear to God, this car looks brand new. And um uh, and the wheel uh, had been uh, had an argument with a curb when my oh. wife was driving it. So, uh, uh, <laughs> or maybe it was me. I don't know. Uh, and so that got, uh, those are like diamond cut, the Zoe wheel. So a little bit harder to get right, but it looks like the car looks like new. So, um, we paid, what do we pay? It's battery lease, which takes a five or six grand off the new price. Cause you're then paying 50 pounds a month to Renault financial services. We paid like 13 grand for it. Uh, two and a half years ago and i went okay. on auto trader this week to have a look for that so like you know what are the comps what we're going to list it for i'll probably give it to richard to put inside his amazing showroom so it's dry this time of year uh, and actually if then if a customer wants to buy it he can sort out finance and you know he gets his like one percent or something so it makes it easier to know a car dealer and um and, and like the the average price is between 14 and a half and 15 grand so you're um, gonna make a profit like two profit years a car that i've driven fifteen thousand miles because Gas prices over here are, well, equivalent $9 a gallon equivalent. We pay a lot of tax anyway, but right. um, heading towards two pounds a liter for petrol and diesel. Um, two pounds a liter. So that's super high. Yeah. 
London has a low emission zone. Many cities are having low emission zones where, you know, you can drive into the center of the city, but you're paying 10 or 12 pounds a day. They're using the number plate recognition cameras. They just send you a bill. Hey, right. you drive into London. In hey, Martin, quid. what happens with the battery lease to the next owner? Because this smart tried this in the U.S. And then all of the secondhand owners were like, you're sending me a bill for the battery. Come and take it out of my car. I'm not paying that. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, do they have to like be approved with, the company or how does that no. work no well i'm i'm on the hook for it until they agree to take so i'm agreed i'm 50 pounds a month i have to pay run i financial services um separate kind of credit organization i guess and then uh then when i sell it there's a form that we fill out uh, like when you if it goes to a dealer or a sec the next person we fill out the form my details their details send it off to Renault, and then they'll start getting the bill um, but yeah I, i've never i i my last one my, my original zoe with a 22 kilowatt hour pack um, I gave that back to my buddy who's got a Renault dealership, a franchise dealership, um, and he hooked me up with the new one. So I just gave it back to him and said, oh, you sort the paperwork. So this one I'll be selling privately. Never done it before. I'm sure it can't be a big deal. Uh, it should be pretty smooth. Renault, yeah. by the way, are, have been calling me to buy out the battery. Oh, that's, that's what they well. want. They don't want to be on the hook for it. Oh, no. Yeah. No, no, no. I think because Nissan got out of this, you know, the, the early lease, <clears throat> Leaf batteries were leased. Um, and I, I get the feeling, I'd happily be wrong. I get the feeling that Renault will continue to lower that buyout price until at some point mm -hmm. they say to all the Zoe owners, have the battery. Like, it's, it's, this is just too much hassle. That's what to, the Smart did. Right? Well, I'm waiting for. That's what I'm waiting for. <laughs> But yeah, like the price has already gone down, the buyout price. Um, and it was still very expensive. As in, what I would pay Renault, I wouldn't then be able to add that to the, the resale of a price uh, a car. Because they're actually the battery-owned ones, called the i version, but the, huh. the, the, the battery-owned ones are only on for like 17 or 18 grand. And that's meant to be a five or 6,000 pound delta between those two. So the battery lease is actually very uh, attractive to people. And but I, if can't you buy over, out I can't... Get over making money on an on an electric car that I've owned for two and a half years. That's stupid. If you buy out your battery pack, does yours then become an I, or is it yeah. valued at the least? Price? Yeah, no. So I could buy out the battery pack, and then I own the whole vehicle, and then it's and an then, I. Yeah, it's, then it becomes an I, and then I sell it on, and 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 somebody owns the whole thing. But it's just it's just, for me. I think for for many people, it's not the numbers do not stack up. Even Renault would have to half the price that they were when they called me. That would be tough to enforce in the U.S., and I think Smart proved it because you know there's very common cases of lease transfers in the U.S. where someone leases a car and they transfer the remaining portion to someone else, and they have to be approved with BMW Financial or Mercedes-Benz Credit or whatever it is. Um, but for a component of a vehicle to then have a separate sublease on top of the, right. I just signed the paperwork, which means I own this vehicle in full. There's not like a little subsection on these buyer's orders really that say, I own this vehicle in full, but someone else owns this component and I agree to then pay them, but they don't have any of my details. So I'm not going to pay it and good luck getting the car back. Right. I, I could never really figure out how battery leasing made any sense. I, I mean, yeah, I, it just makes everything more complicated. Uh, yeah, now we have like this kind of issue, but good for you. And I really hope you get extra extra money for your car. I'm mean, interesting that that situation is the same in the UK as here. You're on mute. You're on mute. I, I don't <laughs> want to make a profit, so I'm not. Right. I'm not. I mean, uh, I, I'm going to sell it for what wait, I can sell it. Why for. do you mean you don't want to make a profit? No, 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 no. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> don't get me wrong. He's I'm a communist. Not... <laughs> yeah, let's, let's all lowball Martin for his. Uh, oh, the lowest bidder wins here. You, you damn Europeans giving their cars away. No, don't get me wrong. I will. I would like to sell it for as much as I can, but I don't want to make. Uh, I don't want EVs to be this expensive. We need, well, no, you know, no. we but need everything. EVs. The second-hand market to be going down, not Martin, going up. It's not just EVs. So I, okay, yeah. I have a 2016 Toyota Tacoma oh, TRD Tacoma. Sport, pretty pretty loaded. Uh, and I'm getting ready to sell it because uh, the lightning, my lightning goes into production May 16th. So, you know, I'm going to probably sell it in April. So I just started looking at used car prices for 2016 Toyota TRD Sports. Excellent condition. Hmm. 60. Yeah, it's, it's pretty loaded too. Um, 63,000 miles. So I've had this thing six years now. Okay. So I paid 32.5 for it. 
The sticker Whoa. price was like 35 back in 2016. I paid 325 for it. Go look on Auto Trader or, or the or the the websites that have like you know cars listed in my area. The average price for a 2016 TRD Sport with the options I have, 60,000 miles, is like 33 to 34 thousand dollars. It's more than what I paid for it. It's crazy. Right. So it's not just EVs. It's that's just the state of affairs on used vehicles today. And those Tacomas already already had like what they call it the taco tax. You know, they always had crazy high resale value anyway. So they always did. I would in normal times, I probably could have sold this for about twenty five thousand, which right. is fantastic for a six year old car that you paid thirty two thousand for. Freeze! You'll only lose seven grand, a thousand, you know, eleven hundred, twelve hundred dollars a year. That's way higher than average resale. But in these crazy times with shortages now, I was shocked. I was when I before I looked at it, I was like, geez, I hope it's close to 30. You know, that would be amazing if I only lose like three thousand dollars. There are some my year that are like thirty six. <laughs> That's nuts. So I think I'm just going to post it for like thirty three, which is like the average price. And I know mine is like probably in better condition than the average because I really take care of my cars and wax them and detail them all the time and always oil changes and everything. So, um, yeah, that's going to be getting put up pretty soon. But it's not just EVs, Martin. It's okay. vehicles. Wow. Oh, and other news. Home battery goes in Monday. I'll give you a full report next week. So nice. um, a bit a more cool? solar. So another another three and a half, another three kilowatts of solar, which will give us a six and a half kilowatt peak. Oh, big system. Uh, system uh, and then a 10 kilowatt hour battery uh it's a solar edge one not a tesla powerwall solar edge battery okay. it's on the dc side so it comes in from the, the the panels into the battery inverter to my house and then back again so i can charge the battery up overnight it's cheap rate at five pence and we're paying 25 pence during the day it, crazy prices at the, at the minute and um and hopefully april to september ish we can go off grid with the amount of what we use hopefully we'll wait and see but nice yeah home battery storage it's the dream right yeah it is That's awesome and and solar edge makes really good equipment the uh, the interesting thing is i had a deal with them uh two and a half years ago they actually reached out to me and they wanted to i have solar system on my house already a 9kw system they wanted to come put in the that whole battery backup and system for free they wow. said, would you do a video series on this, on our equipment and all this stuff? They also sell a solar charger that you, uh, electric mm, car charger that, that. You, you connect to their, their system. And, you know, you, it'll, it'll, you know, charge the car specifically on solar electricity and all this stuff. So uh, we actually signed a contract. Uh, this was in January of 2020. And um, we, we signed a contract. They started shipping me some of the components, small pieces, components like, and they had two electric two visits to my house with their local installer. They looked at my system. They specced everything out. We actually went and, and filed for permits to do all this work. As I said, that was in January of 2020. And then what happened? March <laughs> of 2020, all of a sudden, radio silence. Oh. Emails going back and forth. They're not responding. Finally, like a month later, I get a, a, a correspondence from somebody else in the company. They like laid off. As soon as COVID started, they like laid off the whole team that was working on this type, these type of projects. And uh, so the person reached out to me, they're like, okay, I see we had some kind of deal with you, but as you know, like this, the, the, these, the people, all your contacts no longer work for Solar Edge. Can you tell me what you were going to do? And we'll, 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 we'll pick this project up. It may be another six or eight months. So um, I said, sure. I explained everything to them. They said, okay, great. We'll get back to you. Never heard from them again. Like, Eight or nine months later, I ping them with an email. I'm like, just want to know, is this going to happen? I have like some of your equipment you mailed here, you sent here. It was all just small stuff, nothing worthwhile and um, no response. So, uh, you know, I, I almost had huh, the system that you're getting done here wow. and, here, and that two years ago. But, um, you know, I think if, if COVID would have happened like three months later, they would have been here installing. You know, it might have wow. been too late at that point. To stop it because we were pulling permits and everything wow, wow. john my loss. says uh, it, might, it might happen you never know um I, I mean battery shortages are just everywhere so component shortages um enough batteries to run an air conditioner the weather here doesn't get crazy hot or crazy cold so we need an air conditioner maybe one to two months of the year 
if you want to feel more comfortable. The only place that I have got an air conditioner is in the studio, which is in um, a separate building at the bottom of my garden, which has a, a flat roof. I have a felt flat roof. Uh, it's brick built, but it just soaks up heat. And so for three or four months of the year, it'll get 30 degrees in here and I just sweating. I got lights and all the camera. 30 degrees got, Celsius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's stinking hot. And I got my server stuff. It's all out here. So, um, uh, so I do have air conditioning out here um, and it's a heat pump air conditioner. So it provides my heat in the winter as well. Um, and yeah, I run it for maybe two or three hours a day on a Friday afternoon when we get, when we're talking, I'll run it up because it's just, you know, otherwise I'm just sitting here, you know, with my t-shirt off and no one wants to see that. Right. <laughs> so on, on, on that note, let's talk about Oh yeah, news. Nathan says, move along guys, move along, move along. <laughs> Where's Nathan, the ID buzz? Nathan Green comments, ID buzz, Blazer EV. Those are our big <laughs> stories. So let's get to them because we're already deep into the show. So, all right. So this, so the big news this week is the reveal of the launch and the launch of the VW ID buzz. We talked with uh, Clinton Simone here on the podcast just a couple of weeks ago about his driving impressions. At the time, though, uh, it was hidden between uh, a rainbow wrap. They had brought him over to, I think, the UK to you know drive one around a, a little bit. Mm. Uh, but you know we couldn't really see it, and there were a lot of other details that we didn't get. It, you know we, we couldn't see. So, but now we can in all its funky glory. And I've got to say, I think it looks pretty great. Uh, now, this is the rear-wheel drive short wheelbase that will be available first in Europe, I believe, later this year. Correct me if I'm wrong, Martin. Yep. Um, uh, so our production starts, I believe, September. Right. Okay. Uh, so when it comes to the U.S., the wheelbase will be three inches longer, and there will be uh, battery options, bigger battery options for longer range. Right now, I think they're 77 kilowatt-hour batteries, so like the same as what's in the ID4. So yep, that's correct. Only spec that we know that we're getting so far is that size. It's got to have a bigger battery on long wheel wheel base for the US market. Must have. Right. Yeah. So yeah, when it comes to the US, it'll have that longer wheelbase. And so I think we'll get as big probably as 111 kilowatt hours. I think uh, a Volkswagen person said to Bjorn uh, Newland uh, something about an 85 kilowatt hour battery as well. Mm, so I didn't hear that. So yeah, the 77 kilowatt hour battery, yeah, that's usable. It's actually an 82 kilowatt hour battery as it is. Okay, so, right. you know, 85 would be that much it's, bigger. You know, I, well, I don't, well, I don't think they would, I don't think they would add, you know, seven, uh, eight it kilowatt seem... hour and say that that's their upgraded battery. It's going to no, be it's like one that, module. Though. Yeah, yeah. no, it, it did seem kind of odd. I'm not sure. Maybe I should just watch that again. Um, so, so yeah, but even this, even like this, I think it looks pretty good. I don't know if you want to bring bring uh, Clint back up. So Clint did a special video uh, for Inside EVs. Uh, they let him in the room with one, and he did a lot of filming and, and going through it. And there was lots of uh, B-roll from Volkswagen itself, you know, showing the inside and outside. Um, so yeah, the the interior is super interesting. Lots of colors and different textures, and I think they'll be selling as many as they can make for a while. So, Kyle, I believe you said that this is like the ultimate EV for dog owners, and it does have a huge space behind the rear seats. So what else do you like about this? Well, I think I'm pretty bummed we don't get the cargo version here in the U.S., but I'm also kind of excited because we'll get the long wheelbase, yeah. hopefully bigger battery pack. And you guys know this is right up my alley. I love everything about this. It doesn't need to be fast. The Volkswagen van has never been about speed. I thought Doug DeMiro had an amazing review of this. He went through every single little thing. Uh, I watched it twice, really enjoyed that. So that's the, the video I, I would say, you know, watch watch whatever you want but but that one really had a ton of detail in it and overall was was really cool this this van's great for dogs dominic like like you had mentioned and i think you can just pull the back seats out probably have to unbolt them or something back seats always come out and it was uh you know we could put like a little bathtub in there for dogs i don't know I, there's so many cool things you could do with this i think it'll be i think campers will be I th I also just to get back to the cargo I mean, they got to bring that to the states. They got to bring a cargo with a long wheelbase to the states. I, I don't see why they. Well, there's they, a lot of taxes when you have a non-US oh, yeah. van, and so like the Sprinters, for example, are assembled a lot of them here in South Carolina, right? And uh, and, and here, I mean, in the United States, so they basically right. send the the chassis over from Germany in final assembly. Mine, 
my sprinter was actually final assembly in Germany. And I think they cost the same. So I'm not really totally sure how this all works, to be honest. And maybe it was just because it's an RV conversion, you know, for one of these van life things um, that it doesn't apply for like a cargo particular version. But basically, yeah, there's the chicken tax and it makes it so expensive. Uh, Mini tried this with the club van, <laughs> which wasn't really that practical of a vehicle. I think there was only like right. 60 or 70 sold, but they had massive taxes on them. And um, yeah, but I don't think it needs that much range. It doesn't need that much range. It doesn't need fast charging. It doesn't need uh, that much speed. This is all about taking your time, relaxing, going to see your country with good vibes. And um, yeah, really, I think it's going to be a great dog car. My guess is with the 111 kilowatt hour pack, uh, that we're expecting to see it probably will do about 300 miles on a charge with that battery pack maybe slightly under um three yeah 300 miles i, I think i think in the camper version people will, will want that kind of range too you know this i uh, feel like they have the freedom to go as it's you know, not as... big enough for a camper though you think yeah because my sprinter's 20 feet long and and really tall really right. tall and even that's like the bare minimum for a weekend trip but this okay. So between two wings, it has a comment up here now. Uh, I owned a 1976 VW bus. Huge fan of this, but I fear even the USA version will be too small. The old buses were fairly big. Retro buses were longer and taller than the planned USA version of this. Wow! I because uh, I've seen some buses recently, and I've always struck how like how small they look to me. So yeah, yeah twenty uh, feet minimum in length, tip to tip is kind of what the standard is for these class B RVs. And then they have a lot of height. So like, there's a couple things you could do. Like you'll find the hippies that are like, you know, that will camp out of this thing and put a little bed in there, but they're not going to have a stand up shower and a oh, full no. heating system and, no. you know, a kitchen like, like my sprinter does, which is kind of what you want when you're going out. And, you know, honestly, the, the best part about the sprinter is it has four wheel drive, pretty good ground clearance. I can take it up in the mountains. It's not electric. So I don't worry about making it anywhere. Although I do worry about my fuel tank capacity. It's only like 26 gallons. And even then I'm like, can we make it where we want to go? And we've been considering putting an extended range fuel tank on it. Um, and, um, it's going to be great. You're going to see these around Venice. They're going to be a status symbol. They're going to be owned by, you know, my parents generation who had these things growing up basically, and they're going to feel young again. They could charge a hundred thousand dollars for this. They'll sell every single one they can make. And, um, it's going to be awesome. It's VW's new halo product. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, the, the price may start at 40 grand for the transporter or small battery, or whatever. But if you want to start adding specs and two-tone colors and et cetera, they can charge whatever they want. I'm sad to say, because people they'll sell every one of these. Right. Agreed. And with the larger battery, longer wheelbase, there's going to be all wheel drive option here in the U S the price is going to creep up there. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's not going to be uh, the forty, forty-five thousand dollar van that people are hearing about today. But as you guys have both said, you know that that really they'll sell them. Uh, there's there's enough buyers out there that play in that sandbox, and uh, they'll probably sell every one they make. It's it's such a man. It's just got such a universal kind of capability. You know, I I can see it becoming like a really big uh, delivery vehicle in town. I mean, this could cover any amount of different kind of cargo sizes and different but things. But then an e-transit would be significantly cheaper because of the taxes and it has a lot more room. Yeah. Oh, an e-transit's like twice the size of this thing. But the range, what's the range in the e-transit is like 125 but miles. delivery vehicles, yeah, I mean, this isn't, you know, where are you going to deliver stuff? I don't think that's this car's purpose, not in okay. the U.S. And I think Volkswagen recognizes that. Okay, well, how about minivan? Because that's the other market I, I see it that's, taking. Yes, the market. Yeah. there it is. Yep, yeah. that's the market. It's the family right. hauler. This and is going to replace the old Odysseys, Siennas. This is the new cool van. I think it's going to feel it's feel so much better to drive this than a minivan. I've driven a minivan. I really hate how they feel to drive front wheel drive. And just, have you driven a Kia Carnival though? I have not. They actually are pretty good. No, the last one I drove was a Dodge caravan probably hey that's the fastest version of the vans we've track tested a few of these things and the caravans are usually the quickest the one i drove was not the quickest <laughs> it was kind of dog slow and just like understeery and uh, yeah just yeah, that's uh, what just not family great feel. that's what people care about but, but 
but uh, I don't know. You drive one, so you drive a family hollow like that, but then you take something like this for a test drive, like an all-wheel drive, this thing is going to be amazing. It's going to have great feels, good power, good, just feels so balanced and just fun to drive. I think people will, will be really impressed if they can actually get behind the wheel to try one out. I just uh, hope they make it super soft and comfortable. I love all these interior shots that we're looking at. So there's lots of little plugins. There's lots of room. There's uh, the lights, the what do you call ambient ambience? Lighting. Yeah, uh, uh, ambient lighting, different colors, um, the textures of the seats, and all the different surfaces looks pretty interesting. You know, but uh, that's not confirmed for U.S. market yet. Right. I'm sure it'll be. Well, we're, um, I think we're only going to get the nice ones. I think Volkswagen yeah. is, and or at least should position this as the premium. You know, at least at at launch, make this maxed out. I think hundred grand feels right to me. Just put the hundred thousand dollar sticker on it, and people will pay it. Man, that's a lot of money. Oh. <laughs> but it's got no, it's got no direct competition. It's there's a Rivian R1S, which is not the same. Uh, it's there's nothing. You know, there's going to be a, a, and a honestly, Fisker. The it's price big, makes it desirable. It's a set. The Fisker seven seater is coming, but look, like seven seater long wheelbase in the US, hundred grand. As long as you can spec it up, and you know stuff like those, you know, it needs captain seats in the front that turn around. It needs all those nice features because that that center console we just saw on screen comes out. You can pop that out. It's a walkthrough, which is great, but you got to spin those chairs around if you want that that camper style. So it needs some tweaks from the European spec. But I think they can do that. Put a big sticker on it, and as you know, I, I'm sad to say, the last thing we need is more expensive EVs. But that's that's the way to do this in the US. Yeah, yeah if you want a cheap EV, buy an ID four, and hopefully yes. that price can come down. Like not everything. We just need cheap options. We don't really have a cheap EV option right now. The Leaf is about as good as it gets, which isn't cheap enough. But this is a whole nother class of vehicle. Right. I do like the front, the dash, the, the little shelves on the bottom and different layers and different colors. And oh. I hate that they retained, you can see from this picture, the fact that there's only two buttons for the windows and a little switch that, that switches to the rear windows. Nobody likes that, that owns I, ID4s. And they should have learned, they got a lot of feedback uh, from customers that they, they didn't like it and they didn't improve that on this. And that's, that's a disappointment. They, sh they should have gone back to individual switches for the rear windows. Uh, John, where that comment go? So John Check asks uh, if that if this is big enough to haul my band equipment in. Uh, if I had a, a whole band, which I'm I'm working on, I'm getting one. Uh, <laughs> I have an upright bass player, kind of uh, who I'm working with sometimes, and I think yeah, I think that would be great uh, with three at least three people, and you can fold one of those seats down. So yeah, I think we could make that work for like an over overnight or a weekend gig. I don't think I'd want to do a whole tour. And something like that, yeah, not without maybe a trailer or something. I don't know. That's then that would take a lot of range down. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, so so the thing with the ID Buzz, I think so. There's a before it launched. There was a lot of we we're looking at the uh, the uh, we were looking at it under wraps, and we couldn't really tell. It looked like the shape had changed a little bit from the concept, and you know. We were worried that it wouldn't really fulfill the promise of the original concept, which really got a lot of attention and got created a lot of buzz um, <laughs> for the vehicle. Uh, so I did a little poll uh, on Twitter a couple of days ago. I know, um, Martin, do you have that little image that I, I stuck in the team's chat? Yes. Wow, you're so fast. So this was the big. <laughs> So if you're watching this on YouTube, tube, uh, you can see I've got like a just a front end of the profile shots. And basically, it's just a small difference, really. It's not as bad as I think I thought. Um, the, the hood hood protrudes a little bit farther on the production version uh, than it did on the on the concept. Yeah, we have I got a cargo version of the concept there. And yeah, that. Just so that plane from the windshield to the to the nose is like a little nicer, I think closer to the the original bus, and so it's got like a little bit of a snub nose on the production version, which puts it almost in Astro Chevy Astro van territory, but I think not quite. So anyway, this was like a it seems like a small thing, right? But I don't know. So I, I anyway, I put a pull up on Twitter asking if. Uh, the new ID Buzz successfully fulfills the promise of the concept, and I had 94 respondents, so it's not you know very scientific. 
not a huge poll, but 80.9% 80. 80. of uh, 94 respondents said, yes, this is, this is good, which I agree. You know, I, I was like, okay, all right. I think, uh, I think they actually did it. Yeah, they did. I don't know. I didn't even think it was a question anymore. Things amazing. Right. I mean, I, I wanted to revisit that because, you know, there's so much talk about that leading up to this reveal that, you know, I thought it, worth, it was worth at least taking a look at. I so, just can't wait to see these things with surfboards on them, on the coastline in California, in that yellow color. It's going to be the coolest thing ever. I believe you can put like 200 kilograms on the roof. Yeah. And you can tow a thousand kilograms as well. Oh, to, oh, What's that nice in American? Thing. I don't know. <laughs> two and a quarter yeah, pounds. Of, two, it's like this. My mom used to say, two and a quarter pounds of jam weighs about a kilogram. Mm -hmm. So, so you take your 200, that's 400. So maybe 450. I don't know. I'm not very yeah. good at math. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I get the rough comparison. I just didn't right. know if we had, uh, any, yeah. you know, imperial numbers. Mm. Right. Yeah. So, so really quick, Nils corrected me before I was complaining that it has the same to a uh, window switch as the ID4. And he said, well, it, it doesn't have rear windows, which it wouldn't. The the, the vans oh, with the sliding doors, the windows won't go down. So, oh, yeah. Um, so, you, yeah. So, you know, but I why thought I was, I thought they I was go being down. Yeah. Slick. What's that? Kyle? Why don't they go down? Well, um, if you many minivans or pretty much all minivans, that's the, the door, the doors on the side, they're fixed. No, they, I know. But they, why? Yeah, why does it have to be that way? Yeah, it must be the, you know, I, I because I, the of the sliding door can't, can't, can't lower. Uh, Maybe the sliding door mechanism right. it, yeah. interferes with where the glass would need to slide the, down the to. Door mechanism, you know how it how it the We put a man doors. on the moon. We can figure yeah. out how to make back yeah. the windows of a minivan go down. Yeah. But but this thing one other thing I noticed where they, where they changed from the uh, the the ID four was the gear shifter. If you notice the right. uh, gears. The ID4 has like a uh, BMW i3 gear shifter. It's like almost an exact copy of it. And I like that. You know, it's on the start. You push it forward, you pull it back to reverse. I think it was really functional. Uh, but they went back to like a regular conventional stock on the on the steering column for the gear shifter, which but is But I think it still rotates. Yeah, I think well, it's still I, rotating. It probably yeah. still rotates, but it's not that same like small, compact twist uh, 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 gear shifter that the ID4 has. Right. And it's interesting because they, they, you can obviously see that they did bring a lot of ID4 uh, interior look into this rig. It's very ID-ish, you know, the, the buzz. They, they did it in a retro style, but you can, you know, when you get in it, you immediately think, you know, ID3, ID4, uh, just, you know, with um, a little bit of an upscale and, and retro feel. Mark Rollins, who's watching us on Facebook, uh, says you can lower the windows on the sliding doors of at least one minivan. I believe the Toyota Sienna. Uh, somebody else mentioned the, the JKEV mentioned the Dodge Caravan windows go down. I yeah. bet this will have windows that go down in the back would be my guess. And they're going to use the same rear switch. But fun trick for anyone who owns an ID4, just hold the rear button down for like two seconds. And then the driver's window controls all the windows at once. So it's not that annoying. Sweet. Uh, of course. Uh, so, yeah. So, we saw the passenger version of the e ID Buzz, and then they also have the cargo version there, uh, which they call the ID Buzz Cargo for obvious reasons. Uh, it comes with or without a divider between the passenger and cargo area. And if you get the divider, there's an optional window that you can get. So, you can see what's in the back, or you keep an eye on your livestock if you're carrying goats or, or something I don't know. <laughs> you're putting goats in the van now um, some people put the goats in their vans hey i love that that's the first thing that came to your mind <laughs> which is probably something i would do is put goats in this thing i was trying to think of an animal real fast and that you know i do have friends who like their goats so yes goats <laughs> are go. hilarious there's <laughs> i drive by this guy's house and the goats are always on his roof they all right climb around <laughs> everywhere it's amazing right okay um so let's move on. So let's, I guess, what, what's our time? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, we better get moving along. So, in other news, uh, Chevy teased its upcoming electric Blazer. And so, let it be known there will be a super sport version of it, which they will call the Blazer SS. Uh, it was originally announced at the same time as the Equinox CV, which they showed us. They showed us the Equinox CV in regular LT trim and sporty RS trim. I think RS stands for Rally Sport, maybe. I don't know. Um, really sporty, 
for the Blazer EV SS, they're only showing us uh, a clip of the charge port, which seems to have an maybe overly complicated opening mechan mechanism. Uh, and they showed us the six spoke wheel with the letters SS in red printed at the end of one of the spokes for a bit wow. of an accent. It's a whole lot, I know. Uh, they're saying that it will be available though in the spring of 2023, so like a, a year from now. That's not far off, and hopefully we'll be so. Hopefully we'll be seeing the, the whole thing. Uh, you know, maybe as soon as this summer. So G Chevrolet is GM's most affordable brand, so it's good to see it producing EVs uh, to go along uh, with like the expensive Hummer EV and Cadillac Lyric. Finally, we're getting to something you know the average, more average. Uh, uh, consumer can afford. Uh, so the Equinox EV will be out this fall. And so the bigger Blazer will be the second Chevy built with the Altium architecture. Uh, not sure if there's a whole lot to discuss here really, but Tom, any thoughts about this motorized charge port door or bringing back the SS name? Well, I mean, I don't think that's a surprise that they're going to do a Blazer SS. I mean, their whole line is going to be electrified. So it's just a matter of when. Uh, but I agree with you, way too complicated. Um, you don't need that many moving parts in a charge port. I mean, uh, you know, I'd be surprised if that in that iteration makes it to production. We'll see. But it's it's just too many things that that can break. This thing opens and closes many times, sometimes multiple times a day. Right. It's not like a regular gas flap where once a week, you, you, you know, you're, you're popping it open. So, um, you know, you've got to deal with ice. You've got to deal with all kind of 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 issues that can break that you, you don't want a charge port that complex it looks cool uh but you know for practicality it's it's probably not the way to go in my opinion right i think I, elon musk says uh, the best part is no part this has like things that break down things that can go wrong i don't Look know at all those parts you can it's, see it's, them. A, it's <laughs> you know, the same it's, as the there's too many things that'll break the cadillac lyric has a little fancy motorized door too doesn't it yeah, I was going to ask, is this actually on the Lyric platform or is it a different platform than the Lyric? I think it's probably the same platform. So they might just be using the same mechanism from the Lyric and then they just have the plastic bits cut out differently. Yeah, um, I, I need to see how how the how the Lyric one. I know there's a video of the Lyric port charge port door opening. I'm just not sure if it does that same motion, which would mean if it didn't do the same motion, they would have to. You know. Then it's a whole nother set of parts. But right. I think that has uh, Blazer, to... this has an opportunity to do really well. In essentially the central part of the US, the Blazer is a really hot seller. And, uh, you know, you go to Michigan, these things are on every corner now. Ama I, I don't know why it's so regionally based, but they're very popular in that area. And having an electric version of this is going to be pretty cool. Um, will they have a non-SS version or is it called the Blazer SS only? I think there'll be a non-SS version. There's got to be. Yeah. I think, think they're just teasing it with the SS to let them know there's going to be like a sporty version of it, which is going to be great because it's already, I'm sure the regular version is going to be already like a nippier than the, the regular, like a internal combustion version of it. So we're looking at the internal combustion. It won't Sorry? be hard. Right. Cause it's not really, it's the internal combustion one front wheel drive. You can get all wheel drive, but it has like a 3.6 liter V6 and like a 10 speed, I think. And it's just like always shifting gears and it has to rev all the way right. out to make power and having an electric drive trains. And, and they're, they're, it's a good looking vehicle. Right. It looks um, good. Yeah. I still think Chevy missed the opportunity to take Blazer and go after Bronco. Yeah. Uh, you know, and I think they really, you know, they just made this sort of mom car. But, uh, you know, for the car, forgetting the name, it's not a true Blazer in my opinion. It's a good looking vehicle. Yeah, no, I think it is too, and uh, it'll be interesting to see when they do the like the electrification of it. You know, so take away the open grill section, and you know, just how they adapt everything. Uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see, and we don't have to wait that long to see it, so that's pretty cool. Uh, I don't know anything else. Anybody? When does that arrive? Uh, uh, was there a date uh, on that? A year from now. Oh wow, that's quick. Yeah, yeah, Those that's not bad. Like so fi needed. finally, finally, we're getting yeah. into the good stuff with Chevy, the Altium getting down there. Um, all right. So speaking of grills and facelifts and things, uh, in other news, the Volvo XC40 recharge just got a bit of a nose job. Uh, the changes were quite slight. Martin, if you can pull that image up, um, uh, you tell us whether there's even one change you prefer, that you prefer one over the other. Oh, uh, wow. Look, it looks totally different. Wow. <laughs> I can't, I can't right. believe they've done that. Uh, did I give you a side-by-side? -side? I'm you not did. sure. I'm going to bring I it up in a to. minute. Yeah. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure. It was late at night. I was putting that together. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if you can 
if you can prefer one design over the other or, or even tell them apart you know if you looked at one turned around and looked at the other one <laughs> you know i think the creases on the new one are, there's a bit more you know in the way of creases so the new Which one is has the new, one. the new one's on the left right so it's got yes. the same uh design as the c40 which brings it in line with the family okay yes right. it's basically right. okay. a c40 slapped on the front of an xc40 oh, yeah these right. little thor hammer so, doobies down here the the lights and well, those yeah. lights are also adaptive leds so they you know keep things well lit at night and but they the lower ones more. these lower ones aren't no, no, the, the new ones yeah. the, under the Thor's hammer part. Is that legal in the US now? It is now, I believe. Well, how about it? Past, past. I don't think there's oh, any okay. car that implements it yet. So right. this should implement it, though. That's cool. Maybe. Well, it comes with it. The hardware is available. So just turn yeah. it on. They could just a software update it. Good. So maybe, maybe the bigger part, bigger news of this whole thing is that the uh, there's a front wheel drive version of the C40, which is the coupified version of the XC40. So what we're looking at now, but with a you know, more coupish rear end. Um, so there's a front wheel drive version of that. A single motor uh, C40 recharge features a front mounted power unit, uh, unspecified horsepower or torque ratings. It comes with a 69 kilowatt hour battery, anticipated range of around 270 miles on the on the WLTP cycle. So 69 like, kilowatt hour battery? According to our, our text here on, on our post. I'm pretty sure it's just going to be the same thing as a Polestar 2 front-wheel drive underneath, which is the same battery as the all-wheel drive, just with one motor removed, and they removed the wrong motor. <laughs> that's true. So is that that's yeah. like Polestar 2, 77, 75? 74 hour? kilowatt hour. 74. Right. Yeah, not, maybe it's 69 usable? Is that? No, I don't. I think it's more than that. It's a good no. You've got a good point because I, when I read this story, and this is maybe a week ago or whenever it came out, there is something about it having a different power rating and a different battery rating to what I thought. Uh, then let it's me have a possible. Look. It's a different battery pack. Wouldn't that that would be the story here? Right. If, it, if right. they're actually putting in something different, but can we just can I complain for a second that they yeah, removed yeah. the wrong motor because they already sure, had a place yeah. for the rear motor? Yeah. And so I don't why know why they, why would they the do that. One? Yeah. <laughs> that makes no sense. No I sense, mean, literally no sense. And they're like, it's for packaging. And I said, no. I get it. You <laughs> already have the rear motor. Just leave that one. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. packaged it. <laughs> yeah. You already got it there. Like it, it is the dumbest decision in modern SP or any, any modern Volvo decision, I think, um, to do this other than to not bring the Volvo V90 T8 plug-in hybrid to the US. But that's... You know, so no one cares. So other maybe older, uh, you know, more regular listeners listeners have heard us talk about this a little bit before. But so front wheel drive internal combustion cars, with you know they have the motor the motor they there's it makes there's a reason why they have the front wheel drive because the motor is over the front wheels it gives you more traction. But in a an electric vehicle, the the weight is evenly distributed, you know, front to rear pretty much. So when you take off the, the the weight shifts to the rear so that you you get better traction on the rear. So and, yeah, there's and no things, reason to make a front wheel drive EV from the ground up. And with no motor hooked up to the front wheels, it just handles better. It just has a better feel to it. And, you know, more, more turning radius possibly if it's not all wheel drive. So I don't know why you would do a front wheel drive electric vehicle, but they have, and a lot of people won't notice the difference. Because Everyone keeps saying it's better in the snow. It's not. I'm going to make a video no. on it. <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Yeah, yeah. that'd be that'd be just I will point make it out because it. it's a big change for a lot of people. Yeah, you know? I'll take a rear wheel drive ID4 and a front wheel drive Polestar 2. Hopefully, I'll get one of those on a snowy day together, and then I'll or drive them level, up a hill. Or we'll see tire. Uh, yeah, but you can't get a rear wheel drive one of those. Oh yeah, right, C40. This, the front wheel drive. Yeah. And Man, the... that is such a disappointment. And I knew we knew it was coming. Right. Um, so no no price details yet on the uh, on the front wheel drive C40. But if the battery pack is smaller and it's only front wheel drive, this might be a, a nice entry point to, for people to get into the electric Volvos. I think UK well, pricing starts at forty four thousand for the single. We've got three trims. Okay. I forget what they are. There's like ultimate, exclusive, and something. Um, but for the basic trim, single motor C40 starts at 44 grand, and that's above any of the limits for our subsidies and incentives. So that's what you'll pay. Uh, but over here, Volvo are really pushing the monthly price, uh, whatever it's called, not care by Volvo. What's the name of oh, their the monthly? subscription thing? Yeah. So all the prices on the Volvo UK website are in monthly pounds, huh. not, not because of the lease, but because they're like, hey, 
uh, is it insurance as well, mate? Like insurance, servicing. Yep. Oh. It's not monthly. It's three monthly. Forgive me. Um, but hey, change your car as often as you like. Here's the three. Here's the, the monthly price. Give us a three month notice. They're really pushing that. I, I don't know how popular it is or not. And I'm curious to see if people like that idea of ownership. I've never met anyone here in the US who's done it. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder. But um, I bring, I've got the Volvo UK site. I'll bring that up and show you guys. But so, I mean, it, it starts. It's 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 cheaper than a you know a a, a model. Why? Although, yeah, Model Y is only dual motor here. That starts at 55000 so 10 grand less than a Model Y if you don't want the extra motor in the comparison. Right. right. I mean, not, some people just can't afford the extra expense. And this might I don't be need like, it. I don't need right. it. I don't need the all-wheel drive ever. Weather is not here. We get a week of right. snow in January. That's it, you know. Okay, I'm just looking at the battery packs here. Polestar 2, they claim it's a 78 kilowatt hour pack, 74 usable. This smaller. is likely a smaller and new battery pack. Yeah, they've taken <clears throat> they've taken some modules out or it's a new chemistry or it's a new supplier. Yeah. So 69 kilowatts, 200 so it's 270 miles WLTP, so maybe about 250 uh, 230, EPA, 220. You think that low? Yeah. They're not efficient vehicles. Right. Well, yeah. No, like Polestar 2 is one of the least efficient EVs on the market. Right. Mm. Even more than Audi e-tron? No. Mm, close. Okay. And the Audi e-tron is a lot more heavy, so that makes kind of sense. Um, yeah. So uh, Volvo says the battery can charge from 10 to 80% in approximately 32 minutes on a fast charging system. Yeah. Can so, we just say how good the C40 and XC40 are, though? Regardless of this stupid decision to remove the wrong motor, sure. The, um, the cars, right, Dominic? We had the XC40 recharge, the newer Man, one, at quick, our event. Fun and to drive. Very so good. Quick, and it was the crowd favorite. It feels out so of good. Everything. Yeah, just nice planted feel. It's like good UI, great usability, good image. It's the right image to pull up in a Volvo, isn't it? Because you're kind of right because you're not pretentious but it's a nice car but it's still like right up there as far as like yeah sophistication i would say I it, it's the right look right i like the id i like the id4 a lot too but this is just a little classier basically yeah, it's the next nice. next one up just starts at 44 8 apologies 44 8 uh for the recharge core but again the big bold number is the is the subscription number and this is the volvo uk website and then it goes uh, it goes all the way up to seven one nine for the dual motor. It's a lot uh, of money. Ultimate, yeah, that's like a thousand pounds a month. Thousand dollars yeah. a month. Yeah, that's a, that's a good chunk of change. You could buy it, takes the take the tax credit at least here in the U.S. and sell it and make money. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> not not that I know anyone who's ever done that before. <laughs> <laughs> la, la, right. la, la, la. So we're getting pretty up close to the end of the show, and I I had like a whole list of stories. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to touch about but i didn't really want to get deep into that anyway but i thought we should just should mention a couple things um xpeng is opening this p5 reservation books in four european markets uh so these are all on inside evs if you're curious you can you know punch in xpeng in the search on on inside evs and, and find that story there's a toyota bz sedan or a bz sdn so it's electric sedan spotted uh been spotted hiding a a production body i didn't i hadn't even heard about this coming i just know about the you know the, the bz4x which is a small toyota crossover that's coming here soon but there's a bz sedan coming and so that's something that the next uh toyota vehicles i keep an eye on um what else kia will enter the electric pickup truck segment i thought that was pretty neat i don't know they already sell uh a Kio Bongo 3, that's electric, in, in Korea at least. And that's like the, uh, it looks like a uh, a Japanese K truck. It's a small little truck, you know, trucks you see in J Japan that I, I personally love. <laughs> I, I wanted to import one actually and do a conversion on it and have that as my, my pickup truck vehicle. I thought that would be great. But Kia makes one. But with our import laws, I'd have to wait 25 years to bring it over here. But I guess they're going to have a pickup truck. And I would imagine if they do, they're going to bring it to the U.S. because we're a huge pickup market. Um, they've also greenlit the uh, the EV9. That's a big SUV to come uh, here in 2023. That's also great. Um, yeah. What else do we have here? Uh, 2023 Cadillac Lyric is said to enter production on March 21st 
it is the 11th today so 10 days from now that's awesome news so hopefully we'll be driving that soon and that's uh hugely looking forward to that because that's like besides the hummer review that's like going to be like the start of all these other altium platform vehicles like the equinox and blazer and it'll be great to see what that's all about and yeah tesla confirmed the giga berlin model y deliveries will start march 22. somebody asked how confident we were about the giga berlin model y's coming uh at the top of the show and uh i mean let's well, I mean, they've had a lot of setbacks and a lot of red tape. They've had to cut and recut um, a lot of issues and, and push back from environmentalists trying to get them shut down, even after they have already spent you know, a billion or whatever dollars you know, building this thing. But uh, it looks like it's uh, going to happen for real March 22nd, so like 11 days from now. And that's going to be great. So anybody want to add anything to any of that? The Chinese cars are still very well thought of over here in terms of quality, paint, how they're put together. So that whole thing about German cars being bolted together better than anything else is less of a myth than it ever used to be. So we'll wait and see. We'll wait right. and see. I was and it's, a... it's notable that this is the first time x has released one of their vehicles in multiple markets in, in Europe. You know, it's in um, uh, Norway, Netherlands, uh, Sweden, and Denmark, uh, simultaneous launch. So this is, you know, we're seeing the beginning of the Chinese invasion. You know, I mean, we saw this with Japanese cars back in the 70s, and we're really going to start to see uh, electric brands from China start to proliferate across Europe and eventually here in the U.S. So it's it's notable that with every new vehicle that Xpeng releases, it's bringing it over to Europe quicker than the previous version. And this is the first time it did a launch in multiple markets with one vehicle. So that's nice. that's important to note. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, yeah. So last last week for 100, our 100th episode, I, I, I ended the show with a little, little song and stuff. So this week, we thought we'd continue that with Kyle uh, <laughs> on the harmonica. What? What? <laughs> I, I, I'm kidding. <laughs> No joke. <laughs> All right. Yeah, so. Martin's doing a drum solo next week. So. <laughs> All right. So uh, that brings us to the end of our show. Uh, if you have any questions or comments, you can leave them on the Inside EVs Forum podcast thread or on our YouTube or Twitch comment sections. Uh, if you like the show, please give us a thumbs up. If you're watching us on YouTube, uh, don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Follow Tom Logney at Tomolog, that's with two M's. Martin Lee is at EV News Daily. Kyle Connor is at, it's Kyle Connor. And I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all again next week. Ciao. Buzz, buzz, that's a